Okay, so um, I want to talk about practical sandboxing. What this came about is we in Office sorted out that we could fix vulnerabilities by accident. Okay, so what happened was we noticed that if we ran a .doc file, you know, like the Office 2003 format, through the converter to upconvert it to the Office 2007 format, that typically one of three things would happen. What came out the other end was no longer exploitable because just something got rearranged or you know, there was some embedded pointer in the file and we didn't use that anymore and it didn't make it through the conversion process. Or the converter said, oh, this is a bunch of rubbish and it just dropped it on the floor. Or sometimes the converter would fall over and die. Okay? And so we thought, well, you know, this might actually be a useful thing to really be able to use. And, um, you know, but then we thought, well, what if Dennis creates an exploit so that our converter gets owned up? What then? So the response was to create a highly restricted environment for the converter itself to run in. And so that's what this presentation is about, is the ins and outs of creating a converter. And I've documented this in a fair amount of detail on my blog in like three parts over the last, I don't know, four or five days or something like that, on the premise that probably people in this room have already reverse engineered the thing, figured out how it works, and knows as much as I do about it, and hopefully not more. Okay. So we may as well talk about it and explain what we're doing because it at least has the advantage of maybe you out there, somebody is going to put this to practical use and maybe use it to protect your own customers and you can see what we're doing along these lines. So if we look at the type of sandboxing that's out there, um, one of the two things that we see are ways to knock down the privilege level of an existing application, or we've got some sort of runtime environment, like .NET or Java or something, so that we're going to cause something to run inside of some sort of virtual machine that hopefully prevents security holes and, and so on. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time getting into the various pros and cons of these things, and the piece of software that I was working with was a full Win32 application and wasn't likely to be ported to .NET anytime uh, in the near future. So <clears throat> needed something that I could do right now to deliver some security to um, real people. So there's a really, I think, pretty cool piece of functionality in Windows called restricted tokens. And I've been poking at it for really quite a long time, ever since I first found out about them in, well, gosh, it was about 10 years ago, really. Um, so they're really, really neat, and they're not used very much. And if you read the documentation and then try and use them, you'll find out why they're not used very much. Um, <clears throat> and I document a fair number of things that are you know, really a problem. It's really quite similar to, um, you know, U limits and that type of thing and running as nobody in Unix. And that's effectively the, what I'm trying to achieve as, is running as nobody, but doing it on Windows. So let's look at the APIs. I'm going to just dive real, real deep and I'm going to get really deep, geeky and I'm going to move really fast. So bear with me, okay? Um, and I, I apologize that I don't have as good graphics as Ian had. Um, <clears throat> um, my, my slides are not that great. Okay, so one of the first things to look at is SIDS to disable. So what this is is the groups that are in the token that we want to ditch. So one of the things that is wrong with this API is from a security standpoint, it's completely backwards. We should be, what are the things we want to keep and ditch everything else. Instead, it asks us, what do we want to ditch? And so what you have to do is you have to get the groups that you have and then eliminate the ones that you'd like to keep and just pass all the rest back in. So it's a little bit of extra programming. It's a little bit annoying, but um, 
you know, obviously I didn't write this API or I'd like it better, okay? Um, so there's really only about three groups that you uh, really want to keep. You want to keep the logon ID SID because you need it for the windowing subsystem. You want to keep everyone because if you don't have that, well, all sorts of things will go wrong. And you also want to keep users, actually, because users have execute permissions on the executable files and like program files and that sort of thing. And so you'll find that you don't have enough rights to run very much code at all if you don't have users enabled. So the next thing to look into here is what are the privileges? It's, I got the same complaint. It asks you, what do you want to ditch, not what do you want to keep? Okay? So this to me is, is, is a problem. And one of the things that you can do about it is there is a flag that does the right thing. It says just drop all the privileges. Now, despite the fact that you told it to drop all the privileges, it's going to keep bypass traverse checking. And so it's, it's, it's not documented that it does this, but it does it anyway. And it's really just kind of trying to save you from yourself because if you don't have that privilege, nothing works. All sorts of weird APIs just break and things go really extremely sideways. So it's, it's okay. Um, I find it annoying that we don't call this out and tell you uh, this flag means we'll drop all the privileges but one. Um, but, you know, oh well, that's, that's the way it actually works. It's, it's documented in my blog. How about that? Um, <clears throat> so then we've got SIDs to restrict. And for a long time, I really didn't know what was going on in here and why we wanted to use these. I wrote an article about restricted tokens back in 2000 and published it on a website, and I didn't even talk about um, how to use these things. Um, and it turns out that for what I'm trying to do, they're really, truly very important, okay? So <clears throat> what happens if you don't use them? Well, what happens if you don't use them is one of the groups that stays enabled is the user. Well, how much rights does the user have to the other processes that you launched on the box? Well, really quite a lot, okay? So if the restricted process still has enough rights to get open up an unrestricted process and inject code into it, we haven't accomplished a whole lot now, have we, right? Okay, so that's where this comes into play, all right? So this is an additional bunch of SIDs that's gonna cause a two-pass access check, and here's where we can ditch user and effectively get our token down to nobody, all right? So here's another bit of undocumented trivia, is if you leave restricted out of this list, it just doesn't work at all, all right? And so you have to add in restricted if you're going to use, use this at all. I played with this for a while. It was like, well, let's enable administrators and all this stuff, and if I didn't have restricted in there, it was, it was just... Uh, uh, complete rubbish and, and gave you back weird errors and didn't work. And you add restricted in there and now it works just fine. Okay? So what happens here is when you have SIDS to restrict, we're going to have a two-pass access check. And I've got a spiffy little diagram that will show you how it works in, in, in just a moment. So the first check is in, against the groups that are still enabled in the normal token. It's kind of a normal access check. And then the second check is against the SIDs to restrict. So we've got, here we've got an ACL. So everyone read and administrator's full and restricted read and owner gets full control, right? Okay, so the enabled groups are at this point everyone. All right. So, well, everyone gets read, so, all right, so far, so good. And then our SIDs to restrict have restricted, and we see that restricted also grants read access. So despite that the two passes are granting read access for completely different reasons, the net result is the intersection of the two, which in this case is read access, and away we go. All right. So you could actually have the same group enabled in both cases, and in which case um, you're fine. So it's a little bit of an interesting tweak on things, but um, 
it's how it works. And so that's how we're going to um, force things such that users, if we don't put our own user account in the SIDS to restrict, then it doesn't matter if that's what's in there. We don't get any access to um, our own stuff. So now we've got a process that can't open back up things that belong to us, which is actually pretty cool. You've got a process that cannot even read or muck with your stuff. It's, if you like, start Notepad running as uh, under a restricted token and start clicking around and go to My Documents, it says, I don't know where this is. I can't even figure out what's going on. Another cool thing is if you try and like browse the network, it says Windows network? What Windows network? I don't know about any Windows network. All right, so you've got a process that's like way, way, way um, locked down. Now, so that's a, this is a problem. So one of the things that you know, Michael Howard put out on his blog is he um, read about how I was talking about this stuff in one of our books and decided to implement it. And he essentially made a little speed bump app. And his original intent was to put Internet Explorer in it because, um, well, you know, it's always doing strange things. And so <clears throat> what it would do is essentially the, the equivalent of UAC, but on XP. It would just drop the administrator rights. And so if you had some sort of exploit that was hinging on being an administrator, it would, you know, drop that exploit on the floor um, and, and break it. But it's a speed bump if you don't use the SIDS to restrict. Now, if you do use the SIDS to restrict and you leave the user out, now you've got a huge problem because it really can't access almost anything at all. And so now how are you going to provide things to it, all right? So it, um, it, it, it takes really a, a bit of work to, uh, uh, to, to use these things. Now, here's one of the first things that you'll actually run into is the token doesn't have access to itself anymore. You've called create restricted token, but it won't pass an access check against itself. It can't open itself up. You can create a process with it, and it doesn't have any access to the process that you just created, and it fails with an undocumented code. So this is really annoying, and um, you know the, the conspiracy theorist guys out there might be saying, "Well, yeah, he's got access to all those developers at Microsoft. And he can go read the source code, and that's how he figured it out." No, I figured it out exactly like you would. I sat at home and beat my head against the keyboard until I sorted out what the problem was, and figured it out, and. So that's the second stage. Once we've got the token created, we have to tweak out its ACL so that it actually has access to itself and so that the things that it creates, it will have access to as well. Okay? So that's the, um, that's the second thing you've got to tweak out. So we also, we're also only reducing privileges. All sorts of things can still go wrong. A fort bond can go off. You can alloc unlimited amounts of memory. Uh, you might be thinking shatter attacks and so on. So, yeah, those are all problems. So just using the restricted token by itself doesn't really get us where we want to go. There's still ways out. So stay tuned. So <clears throat> all this stuff was part of a kind of abandoned sandboxing project uh, 